That was the perfect song as we conclude this series, Real Church, Real Life, that we are one in Christ. You know, it's been um, a great summer for us, and today is the last Sunday of August, which means it's really kind of almost officially the end of summer, though the temperatures will still continue to feel like summer for a while, but even though school has started, this is kind of the, the end of summer as we know it in the summer months. And it also depicts that r- the fact that Rainy and I have been here four months now. And it's, okay, some of you were not clapping, but I'm not bitter. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but we're excited about being here for four months, and I'm going to still say I'm your new pastor for another seven months and three weeks. So it's almost time to to stop that, but I'm going to do a little bit longer. But also as I thought about the end of the summer, the end of August, and the end of this sermon series, that we as Christ United have become a real church, a real church that does real life together. One of the reasons we changed at the 9, 10, and 11 o'clock hours so we could do life groups and Sunday school classes and build community as a real church. If you remember the very first week when we kicked off this series, I submitted to you that, that the overarching theme of this letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth is found in chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And throughout this summer, if you've been with us every week, which most of you have not, and I'll just say parenthetically, if you ever miss a Sunday, you can find the service on our website, on Facebook, on YouTube. This is a great way to stay connected, even if you have to be sick or out of town. But throughout this summer, we have learned lessons that Paul taught this church in Corinth, knowing that we would face difficulties and challenges. Paul taught us what real comfort was all about knowing that, that we would live lives that would still be battling strongholds and that, that there would be oppression at times. And, and he taught us what it's like when God lifts the veil in our mind and our heart and, and shows us real freedom in Jesus Christ. Paul knew then and now that the culture in which we live is a, a dark culture at times. So Paul, he showed us real light the kind of light that shines out of the darkness. Paul even knew that these bodies that we have are frail bodies. Paul referred to them as earthen vessels. But he taught us that God in his wisdom gave us real treasure in these earthen vessels. Paul knew that we would have a tendency to want to go back to some old traditions and some old habits and old ways of life. But he taught us that there's real change because anyone who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Old things are passed away, all things become new, and there's real change in your life. But Paul also knew that the church in Corinth and even churches today, that even if you're a real church doing real life, sometimes there are those who will become complacent, those that will compromise. So Paul taught us what real character is all about, what it means to embrace the grace of God and extend the grace of God. Also, hello, Paul also knew that we would face selfishness, that we are are human beings and and we tend to, to be selfish at different times. So Paul taught us how to have real generosity, recognizing that we've been blessed by God in so many ways and and how do we bless God back is by being generous to God and giving even as Jimmy talked about today. And then Paul did something in this letter that he did in, in really no other letter. He, he became very vulnerable, very honest. Paul talked about the thorn in the flesh. He didn't give us any details or specifics about that. Other than that, he was struggling with this thorn in the flesh, and he desperately wanted to be free of it. In fact, he not only prayed to God, but he begged the Lord three different times to, to take this thorn in the flesh away. And every single time God answered, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. So the last two weeks we've seen 
what real grace looks like and what real power looks like. And today, as Paul is finishing up this letter, as we come to the conclusion, he wants to remind us, even as the choir sang about, what it means to be one in Christ. He wanted to make sure they had that relationship with Jesus. And then, beyond that individually, collectively, how do you have real fellowship? So let's look at this letter one more time as we bring it to a close. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning with verse 5. It says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray that you may be made complete. For this reason I am writing these things while absent, so that when I am present I need not use severity, in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Then he says this, finally. Finally, brethren, rejoice. Be made complete. Be comforted. Be like-minded. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, when we look at that first verse that we read, which is verse 5, there's two words in that verse that make us a little bit uncomfortable, depending on kind of where you are in the stage of life. The two words are test and examine. Now, now you think about those two words, and typically your mind will go to two different scenarios. One would be school, the academics. Now, we're going back into school already and getting situated in classes and, and things such as that. And, and when you're in class and you're going to school, you're going to have tests, you're going to have exams. But you may be at a different stage of life. And so you might not think of the academic side. You might think of the medical side. You're going to the doctor a little bit more. And so you have some tests and exams. Either way, how you think about it, whichever scenario, there's a little bit of anxiety that goes along with those two words, testing and examine. Now, for me, when I was in Nashville, Tennessee, I worked at Lifeway Christian Resources. I was a, a manager in the adult discipleship department, had 21 employees, and, and they asked if I would get an MBA. They were willing to pay for it, and I was willing to get it. It was a win-win situation. And it was during the time when universities were, were developing MBA programs for those who were already established in their career. They just needed to have that graduate degree. And so it was a, designed to have a class that you'd be with the same people for 22 months. We'd meet every Monday night, and you'd start with them and you would end with them over that 22-month period. And there were people that were from Dell. There were people that were from Saturn, if you remember the Saturn Car Company, Bridgestone, Firestone, Johnson & Johnson, even from Vanderbilt University that was going to this university to get their MBA. And so there was a lot of folks who were established in their careers. And about six months into it, we had a professor that told us at the very beginning, every Monday night at 6 p.m., we'd have a test, 10 questions. But then... All of us realized we were a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious, even as adults who had real jobs, real responsibilities, just hearing the word test every week made us nervous. But then the professor said this, the scores will not count towards your final grade. Now initially, you would think, okay, fine, I'll take any test as long as I'm not scored on it, it doesn't make any difference on the final grade. But then the professor said, this test is for you, is to show you each week where you stand, how much you understand, how much you're learning, what questions that you have, what do you need to learn and read a little bit more. 
It was a test strictly for ourselves. And I think about what Paul is writing. He's saying that you are to test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves. In fact, in the Greek, when he wrote this, the pronoun is at the beginning of the sentence for emphasis. So literally, in the Greek, it would read this. Yourselves test. Yourselves examine. He's saying the emphasis is on you to do this. Paul was being very honest. I can't do this for you. That, that your friends can't do it for you. Your spouse might want to do it for you, but your spouse can't do it for you. That also means that you as parents cannot do it for your kids. But Paul is saying that you need to test yourselves to see if you're in the faith to examine yourselves. Now, the only way that, that you can do that is if you're willing to be honest with yourself, to really look below the surface, to ask yourself questions that you may not ask on a regular basis, and to take a close look underneath. Now, Rainy, she, she has this mirror in, in the bathroom. It sits on the, on the counter. And I don't mind mirrors. For me, uh, I prefer mirrors in rooms that are dimly lit and there's a distance in between me and the mirror. Those are my favorite mirrors. But this is the kind of mirror that magnifies some 2,000%. And the only way that that mirror works are if two things are in place. One, there's light. And two, you actually look in it. And I've tried it before. When you look in it, you see things you don't normally see. And I think about this when Paul is saying to test yourselves, to examine yourselves. He's saying that you've got to look in places that you've, you've never really looked before on a regular basis. And you need to do it in the light. Did you notice what he said? That he told you that, do you not recognize Jesus Christ is in you? Remember, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So you have the light in you. As a Christ follower, as a Christian, we have Jesus Christ in you. And so, so he said that you have Jesus in you. Hold yourself up to the light. Look at Jesus and then look at yourself. And if you want some questions to ask, if you want your little pop quiz that will not be scored for the final grade, but just to kind of see where you are, here are some questions to ask. One would be, do you desire the things that Jesus desired? When you read about Jesus, how he lived his life, how he handled relationships, how he handled conflict, when you look at the life of Jesus, do you desire the same things that Jesus desired? Another question would be, do you spend time with God? Now, I'm going to make it a little tougher. Do you spend time with God outside of Sunday mornings in church? We love that you're here on Sunday mornings, but there's six more days of the week. Do you spend time with God in those times? And I'll be real honest with you. I, I'm not the kind of guy that gets up at 4.30 in the morning, reads the Bible for an hour, prays for an hour. That's not me. I do read the Bible every day. I do pray every day. I tend to listen to Christian music in some form or fashion every day. And whatever it is that works for you, there are some that have very specific devotions that they look at every single day. Some have a specific Bible reading that they do every day, and I've done some of those things over the years. But my encouragement to you is to ask yourself, do you spend time with God? And if not, why not? But then if you do spend time with God, are you listening to God? Sometimes we, we want to hear the voice of God like this thunderous sound coming down from the heavens. Sometimes we forget that God speaks in a still, small voice. Sometimes I've found that God even whispers. Do you listen to God? And then another question would be, is the Holy Spirit moving in your life? The Holy Spirit moves very differently in Rainey's life than my life. And it's that way for every single person. But when you are going through a difficulty, when you are being challenged, when it's a frustrating season in your life, and you take it to the Lord, do you just sense a, a peace that really you can't explain? A peace that surpasses understanding that's the Holy Spirit moving in your life. 
When you have a decision to make at work or in life or in a relationship and, and you don't know exactly what to do and you take it before the Lord and, and you feel kind of nudged in one area, you can't explain it, you kind of feel nudged in one direction, that's the Holy Spirit moving and giving direction in your life. But then what about this? When you do something wrong, when, when you make a mistake or in, in the church language, when you sin... Are you convicted? Do you feel bad? That's the Holy Spirit moving and convicting you. These are some very basic questions just to kind of test yourself and examine yourself. Where do I fit with God through Jesus Christ? He, he goes on to say in verse 7, Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we may appear unapproved. Paul is saying that, you know what, we want to pray for you. And we want to pray for all that God's doing in your life. We want to pray for you as a real church, doing real life, going through real struggles. And whether or not that people see us as approved, because if you remember the last couple of weeks, there have been some hardships that Paul faced and people kind of bad-mouthing and uh, giving some negative comments on Paul. He said, whether or not people like us, we want you to do no wrong. We want you to do what is right. Now, Paul is not saying to be perfect. Paul is saying that you seek and pursue holiness, that you are sanctified, that, that God is moving in your life and growing in your life to do what is right. If you think about testing your faith and testing and examining yourself as this vertical relationship with God of where you stand, doing what is right is more about the horizontal relationships. To do what is right in your relationship in your marriage, with your friends, with your, your co-workers, to treat them with respect, to be kind, to be patient, to speak truth in love and don't talk behind their backs and say things, but to confront them in a godly way, to do what is right. Or even in your, your workplace, to do what is right, to give a full eight hours, to, to be productive, not to look for shortcuts, and not to look for the most minimal way of just getting by, but to maximize your time at that job for the benefit of the company, to do what is right. Even as a citizen, to do what is right, not politically, but to do what is right as a citizen, to be a good neighbor, to take care of your neighborhood, to know your neighbors, to observe the laws of the land, to exercise your right to vote, to do these things. And I would take it a step further to pray for our city, to pray for our state, to pray for our country. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to pray for me Tuesday morning, this Tuesday, because I have the privilege and the honor of leading the invocation prayer for our city council. Ever since Rainey and I have moved here four months ago, we've been praying for this city. We've been praying for this state. We continue to pray for our country. It's an honor and a privilege. And Paul is saying to do what is right in all that you do, relationally, vocationally, as a citizen, as a Christ follower, to do that. Then he says this in verse 8, For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. That Jesus is the plumb line. That Jesus is the one that, that we look at that if you think of a plumb line, it gives you this point of reference and see how everything measures up to that. And Jesus being the truth, the only truth, that we look to Jesus. Are we off track? Are we going in this direction? Are we going in that direction? How do we line up with the truth of Jesus Christ? Paul wants them to, to look at their lives in a new and a fresh way. He goes on to say this in verse 9. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray that you may be made complete. Do you notice a theme here? That Paul, more than anything else, wants them to be in good shape. In good shape spiritually, in good shape relationally, in good shape with God, in good shape with man. To be a real church doing real life together. So, you know, we're praying for you. Even though we might struggle, even though we might be going through some weakness right now, we celebrate that you're strong. As Jimmy said earlier, that, that there's something going on in this church. 
that God is moving at Christ United. And what a great place to be. And Rainy and I, we pray for this church. I hope that you pray for this church. I know our staff prays for this church to do these things that God has called us to do. And Paul uses this phrase that you may be made complete. Think about that. Not just 70%, not just 80% or 90%, but you're complete 100%. When I think of that in my mind, my mind's eye goes to a tapestry. If you've ever seen a tapestry hanging on the wall, it's this beautiful woven masterpiece until you turn it on the other side. When you look on the back side of a tapestry, it's a mess. There's knots going all over the place. You have all these different things going in different directions. You can't make heads or tails about the picture. And that's what Christ does with a real church that does real life together. He'll take all our messiness, he'll weave it together to create this masterpiece. Paul wanted that church and every church today to be a real church doing real life and to be made complete. He goes on to say this, for this reason I am writing these things while absent so that when present I need not use severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. If you read the entire letter of 2 Corinthians start to finish, you will see that there are some challenging words that Paul writes, some difficult things that he calls them out on, that they were silent when they should have stood up for him, that they compromised when they should have stood firm on the foundation of their faith, that they got caught in some sin and all that. He said, you know what? I'm going to write those things in love so, so you can deal with those things, but I never want to tear you down. I always want to build you up. You think about what God does in our life, even as this church, that God wants to build us up. He wants to grow. He wants us to be a light in this community, not just in Northeast Jackson, but beyond. How can we be built up? The only way to be built up is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he brings this letter to conclusion, he writes these words. He says, finally, out of all that I've written, finally, brethren, rejoice. Not just to be happy, not just to have a smile on your face when everything's going well, but to truly rejoice, to have that joy that comes from the inside of your spirit and your soul, that joy that happens again and again, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. And then he says that you are to be made complete. Second time he uses that. Anytime you see something more than once, especially in a short amount of time, it draws our attention to it. He wants them to be made complete. And then he says, be comforted. And even that phrase bookends this letter. The very first chapter, our very first sermon in this sermon series is about real comfort, the God of all comforts. If you remember, the reason that we're comforted by God is so we can comfort others. He wants this real church in Corinth to be comforted. And then he says, to be like-minded. We believe the Bible. We've made choices over the last year and a half based on this Bible. We stand firm on the truth of God. We are like-minded in that way. But one thing I will admit to you, that in the last four months, and this may come as a surprise, but some of you have opinions, and that might be a surprise to you, and some of you have different opinions about all sorts of things. But when it really matters on Scripture, we are like-minded. We share those values. We share that truth. When there are some other things that we might disagree on, the very next phrase that Paul says, live in peace. Learn how to get along on those things that may not be essential, but those things that are essential and bound in the truth of the Word of God, stand firm and be like-minded. Then he gives this promise. It's not a suggestion, but a promise. He says, and the God of love and peace will be with you, not may be with you, not sometimes, but will be with you. And when all is said and done, he describes what real fellowship looks like. That when you rejoice, 
when you're comforted, when you are like-minded, when you live in peace, when you are complete, that you have this real fellowship. And the last sentence he writes in this entire letter gives the perfect picture of real fellowship. Look at verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Did you catch that? He talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The perfect picture of fellowship. They have the God who is the God of all comfort. The God who loved us so much he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and to be risen from the, the dead. Jesus, when he ascended into heaven, left us the Holy Spirit so that we might have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The perfect picture of fellowship. This morning, as we conclude this series in this particular letter to 2 Corinthians, I want us to have the courage to, to test ourselves, to examine ourselves. Where do we line up with Jesus Christ? Today might be a day that you want to recommit or realign or just maybe confess some things privately or just celebrate what God is doing in your life. As we come to this last song, the, the altar is open. I always like to think of this song as a, a song of praise, but also a song of response. To come before God in this posture of kneeling before him and saying thank you. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you for this real church. Thank you for a place to do real life. And God, I want you to do a real work in me so I can be part of this real fellowship. What a joy that is be part of a church like that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the plumb line that is Jesus Christ himself. And we ask for courage to look beneath the surface, to see where we align with you. And God, I pray that you would draw us closer to you, that as Christ united, we would be united in Christ. So Lord, we ask that you would do your work this week, in the weeks and months and years to come for your glory. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.